The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Action Show episode 392. My name is Chris. And my name is Noah. Hey, Noah. Good afternoon to you, sir. Coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, it is indeed a big show. We're going to look at the often requested SolOS OS. SolOS OS, perhaps? It is a brand new, from scratch Linux distribution with its own unique desktop environment. And they have a lot of really interesting things under the hood we're going to tell you about in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Also, in the news segment, we're going to dig into the bad news for the Yala project and their money problems. The big, big update coming to GTK. KDE's got a new Plasma 5.5 they want you to know about. And the highlights from the Linux Kernel 2015 Summit. And we've also got some interesting, uh, well, you might say... Big news, actually. For those of you who have been wanting Windows emulation and full 3D support, QMU has a solution for you. We'll break it down on why you're going to be wanting to update your QMU packages very soon. We also have feedback, but before all of that, Noah, you know what we've got? The picks. Wow, yeah, that is the creepiest the picks we have, we have ever had. That's right, Noah. Uh, and you ready for this, Noah? I picked this one specifically for you. Uh, okay. Because it reminded me of your house. This smart light switch by D-Link runs Linux. It is called the Comfy Switch, and it has Ooh. a camera. Mm -hmm. That looks amazing. Yeah, it also has a CO2 sensor, uh, temperature sensors, and it also supports if this, then that. It is a light switch that you install in your frickin' wall that runs Linux kernel 3.88 on a 520 megahertz ARM 11 processor. While the camera also has its own Linux-ready umbrella system on a chip with a Cortex-A9-based HD camera processor. The camera is equipped with a 3-megapixel sensor and a f2.54 aperture, Noah, right built in to your frickin' light switch. Now, remember how you have some cool light switches in your house? Mm -hmm. Well, now, take it up a notch for the new house, Noah, because these are even cooler. Look at that. You know... Uh, it, it's really cool, and I'm thrilled that it runs Linux. I don't know that I want cameras everywhere in my house that are cloudy. You yeah, know? that are that are that are cloudy. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's cloudy. a good way to I put don't it. Want, I don't want cloudy cameras in my house. Then every time I'd be walking, every t here's what would happen. Here, you picture this. <clears throat> get your imagination cap on. I would get up in the middle of the night in my skippies, and I would be going to use the potty, and then I would start thinking to myself, self. The NSA is watching you through that light switch. And then uh, and then like I would start turning around. I'd be like, no, I don't want to face that one. Oh, I don't want to face that one. I don't, I don't right. know. It just wouldn't work. Does it make you feel any better that it has a hip YouTube video with a hip soundtrack that you can watch and makes you feel better about all of it? I'm becoming more convinced. Thank you. Comfy. More than a smart switch, it's also a camera with a Swent sensor. Keep it on your favorite faces, spaces in full HD. Control your lights. That's good for light switch. Yeah. Detect sound and motion. And records moments of moments, records those moments to a private cloud account. <laughs> Not so cool. I'm no longer comfy anymore. Senses air quality. Yeah. You know, this is how your dick gets picked online. This is exactly. I fell out. See, remember that cliff example we were just talking about? This was it. I followed them right up to the edge, and then they jumped off a cliff, yeah. and I didn't follow. I do like the detensive. That not it can do. It can do humidity. It can do temperature. It can also do uh, CO2. All of those things are nice, uh, and it comes in white or black, and that's also nice. I don't need a camera in my light switch. I don't need a camera in my light switch. I don't need a camera that talks to my iPhone. I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't need this. Just the light switch will be fine. Yeah. 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 It says the guy with all the smart light switches. Well, yeah, but that's all they do is they turn the lights on or off. I can just control them a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, because I want D-Link to go die in a fire, I also have a backup runs <laughs> Linux this week. A double runs Linux, if you will. Oh, wow. This one comes from Mike. A twofer. Mike Reed at MRReed78 on the Twitter. Mike, here's the thing. If you were born in 1978, I sure as hell hope you didn't just put that in your Twitter handle. Now, thank you for sending me a runs Linux, but stop. <laughs> everybody, everybody on the internet, all of you, stop putting your birth year in your damn username. You're giving away information that I need to hack your ass. Stop putting your yeah. damn birthday in. Anyways, so mread78 on the Twitters sends me this awesome capture, Noah. Check this out. The Wendy's fast food restaurant entertainment system runs Linux. That is, in fact, a grub. There it is right there. There's the grub load screen as he is waiting for his Frosty at Wendy's. I thought it was pretty nice of him to send this to me. Also, probably getting the Baconator, but adding onions because he's not an animal. 
thank you, Mike, for sending this in, and I hope that you weren't bur- born in 1978. And if you were, and if you were, the the entire last audience is now is now aware of the fact <laughs> that the 78 is pot- potentially his birth date, and his full name was just displayed on screen. Says Mike 89 in the chat room. <laughs> 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 Shoot, you can join us over at jblive.tv if you'd like me to out you live. We have a live show on Fridays, although next week we're not quite sure if we're doing a live show on Friday because, well, uh, in, in the United States of America, Black Friday is a, uh, is a dangerous day to go out. So we, mm-hmm. may, we may do the show on Sunday. Uh, I may put something extra special together for you guys, and we're not live, but check the calendar over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. But shoot, we'd sure love to have you join us live, and we have an IRC room that's going 24-7, irc.geekshed.net. And it is pound mother effing Jupiter Broadcasting. No, I'm kidding. It's pound Jupiter Broadcasting to join us. What are you laughing about? You. <laughs> what? I love you. I just, I love it. I love it. Uh, I, I know. Love how are you doing, man? So you've been moving all week, right? Have you actually I know. been it's moving? It's been so stressful. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've said this numerous times. I think people think it's a joke, but I'm not kidding. The next time I move, it'll be feet first. You'll yeah. have to kill me to get me out of the house because I will never, ever do this again. Are you in the new house now? Or yes. like, what's going yes, on? But here, oh, you yeah, are. I'm in the new house, but here's the problem. I don't have a bed because <laughs> oh, I, I don't have I don't have a bed because the, the master bedroom isn't isn't done and we can't do the master bedroom until we sort the electrical thing out in the basement and the electricians are working and I have internet guys that I, I, I made the internet guy the easiest install he's ever done in his life. I ran brand new quad shielded RG6 from nice. the outside of my house inside down to my <laughs> network board. I stapled everything. All he had to do was come put ends on it and then he comes and he's like, yeah. Sir, uh, mm. so uh, mm. we went out in the back there, and uh, looks like the feed coming into your house has like electrical blowouts where lightning hit it like every six feet, and so um, that degrades the quality of the signal, and we can't use it. What? Well, so what do we do? And he's like, "Well, we'll set a new one across your backyard." And I'm like, "Uh, what? we live in North Dakota, yeah." So now there's a cable that is hanging off the tower or the post or whatever, and is just strung across my backyard until they can get to it in the spring and do something different. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it has been it, like every time I turn around, somebody wants money. Oh, yeah. And somebody has found a problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I totally feel there. I mean, I've been going through my own set of paperwork for my own issues, and it is completely nuts at every standpoint. Every single, oh, we have yeah. to discuss this. We have to figure mm-hmm. this out. Somebody has to and, sign and on this. Do, and you have to do it in person because God forbid we just send an email. And you have to sign yeah. things because yeah. God forbid we just check a box like I do in my <laughs> IRS. Tax returns, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, uh, you know, I realized there was a little story we didn't share with the audience that is actually pretty funny from the return trip from System 76. So uh, I don't know. We, uh, just long story short, Noah is a great guy and decides to join me. So that way I have company while I wait for my my oh, flight. Yeah, this story, <laughs> even though even though Noah doesn't fly out for the next day. So I'm flying out Friday night. Literally, we get off the air last week from episode 391 of the Linux yes. Action Show. We pack up my stuff and we get in the car and we go. Now, now hold on, pause for a second. You have you have to picture this. Chris is such a nice guy that what he does is he'll take the ma- ma- minimum amount of time necessary to be polite and then move on. So like he's like, hurry up, get the stuff, let's go. Wait, hi, oh thank you so much for having us out here. It's been a really great time and we really enjoyed being on the air here live from Sif- System Seventy Six. Okay, let's go. Let's, let's go, 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 go. Let's go. <laughs> so we get in the car and we're driving, and like uh, I'm tailgating the heck out of everyone in front of me. Yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm I'm having mild anxiety attacks because honestly, it's not my fault. The damn clock in our rental car, which was from Denver, was yes. off by an hour. So I'm right. literally, and we're stuck in traffic, and there's an accident, and I'm like, I'm applying Seattle logic to Denver. I'm like. Okay, well, we just had two egg cars pass us, and we haven't even seen the wreck yet. That means we have 45 minutes before we make it to the yep. wreck, and we have an hour before we get it. And I'm sitting here freaking out because the the clock is wrong in the damn rental car. Right, but even with the clock being wrong, I'm like, I think we're going to be all right. I think we're going to make it. Yeah. I, I made it to airports <laughs> at this time before, and I think it'll be all right. So we get there, and he's like, well, we're almost there. And you're like, how am I going to find my gate? And I'm like, no problem. I've been to Denver numerous times. I'll just come with you. Well, there's a problem because I don't actually have a boarding pass to get through security. Right. So I have a, I, my best friend works for an airline and I know a couple people that are gate agents. And so I, I'm, I'm familiar with the concept of a gate pass. And basically it means you can go through security, but you can't actually get on the plane. Yeah. Like well, you forgot it, some sunglasses. You forgot your bag. Or right. the friend you're with is disabled and needs your assistance. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, so we get to the airport and I go up and the guy's like, I, I'm like, I need a gate pass. And he's like, why? And I'm like, well, I'm accompanying my friend. And he's like, <laughs> Why? So uh, I'm texting one of my buddies and I'm like, 
how do I, what's the best BS line to use for a gate pass? And he's like, tell him he's disabled. So now, like, mind you, the only reason Noah's doing this is because I've just had a hard day, and I'm like, I don't really feel like finding this place on my own. Will you come with me? It, not only that, well, no, that's, okay, you're underselling yourself. That's, you know, maybe a little bit of it. The other part is, you were going to have like an hour that you're going to have to sit in an airport by yourself, yeah, yeah. which just sucks because you're surrounded by a bunch of strangers that are, and everyone's rude in an airport because everyone's mad about something. And we hadn't eaten yet. So both of us were hungry. That's true. And if, if I dropped you off at the airport, you have to eat by yourself and I have to eat by myself. And frankly, I'd rather starve than eat by myself. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, so we get to the airport and we got to see the little swirly things uh, in the train, which we missed on the way in. Yeah, the Denver airport is really cool. It's laid out in a way where you can jump on it on like a, like a subway. And it mm -hmm. moves you between the different segments, and they have, like, fancy artwork in the tunnels and things like that. So we get to the, we get to the, the, the gate, and, or no, we, get, we stop and we get some food, and then we get to the gate, and as it turns out, not only, was, not only would we have made it if the clock had been right, not only would, uh, was the clock not right and so we had an extra hour, yep. but then as it turns out, the flight attendants... Uh, got into an accident or something. There was an accident, and so the flight attendants yeah, the traffic were delayed. was bad. So we're sitting there, and, and Noah and I are like, you know, we're, we're kind of just chatting about stuff. We're sitting at my gate. I'm like, oh, boy, this is good. We're, we're sitting here. We have, we've eaten. We have plenty of time. They're going to start boarding in about 30 minutes. And, you know, Noah, you guys don't really understand, but Noah flies quite a bit. He might, he might fly, you know, he might take an uh, hour and a half flight just to go to Panda Express. This guy, that okay? might have happened once or twice. <laughs> and I might have gone to Panda Express twice just since, just since I've been back in Arlington. But it, the, the funny thing about Noah is he, you can kind of, you can kind of suss out of him like a good situation and a bad situation in an airport. He doesn't even have to say anything; it's just on his face. And so we're sitting at the gate, and the plane is parked there. And Noah's like, "This is a good thing. This is the last flight back to Seattle. This whole crew has to go home." This flight, you're you're in good situation. These guys want to go home. They're gonna fly out of here regardless of what happens. You got no problem. And he's you know he's kind of getting himself ready. And and one of the uh, flight people comes on and says, uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the flight to Seattle has been delayed because we don't know where our flight attendants are." <laughs> And we, exactly we, we just start too. laughing. <laughs> <laughs> they they lost the flight attendants to my return flight back to Seattle, and I'm like, no, you don't understand. I, I have shows I gotta go do. Like yeah. I gotta make it back tomorrow. <laughs> you don't understand how this works. And Noah's like, and Noah's like, okay, well, I gotta go because now it's getting to be late, and he's got to make it back to System 76 because Noah's got to pack everything up on his own because I gotta hit the flight, right? So he's got to make it back to their office from the airport minimum 45 minutes away and go pack everything. He's like, I gotta, I gotta go, man. And I'm like, okay, but he's like, you might be here for a while. And Noah, truth be told, like if they had to call in the reserve flight, the reserve attendants, I would have been screwed, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, so the, the thing is, I was actually impressed because most of the time to get a reserve, because the reserves, if, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a long call reserve, they're sitting at a hotel. Yeah. And so then they call them and they're like, Hey, we need you on a flight. And so they have to get dressed, get into the van, drive over to the airport, get through security or bypass security get up to the gate and and then get on the flight. So we're talking like an hour, like, right? Yeah. And, I'm, and well, the thing <laughs> is, they said that they would have people at System 76 by 8. They told us it would take 45 minutes to go from System 76 to the airport. But in fact, we weren't even close to that. It was much longer. Yeah. And so I'm like, what? what's the, there is no backup plan if everyone leaves System I, I, 76. I love Ian, but Ian's like, look, guys, no matter what, it's going to take you 45 minutes to get to the airport. And so Noah and I are sitting there. Twice we're stuck. That. We're in stop and go traffic, right? And I don't. And I don't. I don't mean to call him out, but we are in stop and go traffic. And Noah and I look and go. We're like, it has been an hour. We are not. And we, and then I go, Noah, dude doesn't have a car. <laughs> like, yeah. dude, dude, yeah. Don't, yeah. He doesn't drive, man. How can he tell us it's gonna yeah. take us forty five minutes? Anyways, so I'm sitting in the gate. And Noah's like, well, I gotta go. I, I this could take an hour. I've got to make it back and go pack up all our gear. I gotta get out of here. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Thank you for hanging out with me. He takes off, and about ten minutes after you took off, a couple of flight attendants show up, and they're like, "Well, that's good." Yeah, they're like, well, "Don't freak those. out! Don't freak out! Everybody else is just stuck in traffic. They've been in traffic for an hour. That that forty five minute thing, Noah, out the window, man, out the window at this point. He's like, yeah, yeah they've well, been stuck in traffic for an hour. They showed up about fifteen minutes after that, and we took off about mm, forty minutes later than we were supposed to, and all was fine. To be fair about it, um, I think you and I both kind of lightsabered the whole 45 minutes to the airport thing. Yeah. We were working with different information. <clears throat> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, and this was also, just a little side note, return flight, uh, last 30 minutes, I woke up from a nap, motion sick, first time in my life. Really? Yeah, yeah, first time in my See, life. I don't, even, 
I don't even understand motion sickness. So. I, I've never had it before either. I, I look down on people that had it. <laughs> now I'm like, it was yeah. my yeah, hands. You're like wimp. It's gross. My hands got so sweaty I couldn't use my phone because huh. I couldn't make con- it wouldn't make electrical contact. Anyways, it was gross. But I got back. I landed. Uh, Hadia picked me up. We drove back. It was it was really a good trip. And uh, Rover Log 15 is out. If you haven't seen it yet. Uh, it's a little bit behind the scenes of some of the uh, production issues because I forgot probably the most important piece of equipment. And then and then <laughs> yeah. it literally came down to the wire where Noah had to make us a wire so that we could get online. All of that captured in, in Rover Log 15. Did you get a chance to watch it, Noah? I watched the I watched the first little bit of it, and yeah. then, of course, I got interrupted. Yeah. But yeah. I'm going to go back and you watch should. it because that— You should see that your was part where the, you save the day. You'd like that part. That was one of the— I think that was probably one of the funner trips yeah. that we've taken by yeah. far. I mean, it's pretty cool because you can forget a few things and you're at a computer company. So it turns out, they, like, I didn't even bring a computer. I didn't even bring a laptop. And then I had mm-hmm. to borrow the Oryx. You know, I had to, I had to borrow the gotta Oryx. You got to do what you got to do, man. And that was, for, you. I know, I, it's not a review. And I'm not, I, you know, I'm not even going to pretend it's a review because it's a pre-production unit. But that was a real delight. I tethered it to my phone. I sat in the hotel room and I set that thing up. And I didn't care that it was running Ubuntu. I loved that machine. It was really great. Uh, it was a fun, fun trip. So anyways, if you haven't seen episode uh, 391 of Linux Action Show, you should definitely check it out. But you know what else you should check out? Our friends over at DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and try them out. Here's what they did. They said, hey, you know what's great? Linux. You know what else is pretty kick-ass? SSDs. And then you know what else is the ultimate dominator? KVM. They took that stuff. They put it together. Now, sure, you could do that, but you know what you can't do? You can't create their incredible interface. You can't do it at the scale they can do it, and you can't do it with their tier one bandwidth deals. Man, DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get your own Linux system. You can get started in less than 55 seconds. You can get a server in 55 seconds. It's just crazy. And pricing plans, they start only $5 a month. I think my breakfast today costs more than $5. Five dollars a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, all SSDs, regardless of your plan. One CPU and a terabyte of transfer, just at the starting price of five dollars a month. And if you use the promo code Last Digital, that keeps the Linux Action Show on the air. That also gives you a ten dollar credit at DigitalOcean. Hey, look at that! It's a twofer. You see how we did that? You support our show. Tell our sponsors that because they support us, you encourage that. You want to go there. You want to use that promo code last digital. That lets them know, hey, we can keep investing in Linux Action Show. We can keep them going. And it gives you a $10 credit. You can try out that $5 rig two months for free. That's nuts. See, it's actually, it, it, it's, almost, it's almost disingenuous for me to say $5 a month because you could actually break it down on the hourly scale. And it's really straightforward. If you go over to digitalocean.com, you click on their pricing, click on the hourly tab. Now, here's why I say this. Because you guys are really clever, and they have a straightforward API. It's, it's, I mean, like, I don't know anything about development of anything. I, I could write yourself, I could write a Bash script, I could read a Python script and a Ruby script and a Perl script, and that's about, oh, and PHP, of course. I mean, come on, I'm not an animal. Obviously, I'm not a monkey. I could do all of those things, right? But actually using something that uses the API, now I thought that'd be beyond me. No. They treat their API seriously. It's very approachable. But the other nice thing is there's a ton of open source code out there already on GitHub that uses that API. Now, why do I tell you that? Use the API to spin the rig up when you need it and use the API to spin it down when you don't. So you're going to get a Minecraft server. Go get a Minecraft server with a crap ton of memory and CPU and transfer. You got a big project. Go get a server with a whole bunch of memory, CPU and transfer. Use the API to spin it up when you need it and use the API to spin it down when you don't. It's infrastructure on demand. And DigitalOcean has CentOS, they have CoreOS, they have Debian, they have Ubuntu, they have FreeBSD, and they got Docker all up in their business. All up in their business. Make a Docker image on your thing, right? I don't care if it's a desktop, a laptop, or a MacBook. I mean, I kind of care if it's a MacBook, but I'm going to pretend like I don't care. And then you can upload it up to a DigitalOcean droplet using the Docker Hub, because that's crazy easy and Docker makes it no problem. And you can deploy it on a DigitalOcean droplet out in production, no time. Now, secondary plug, use Hover, right? Go register the domain at Hover, point it at Docker, uh, go point it at your Docker on your DigitalOcean droplet, go use their incredible, incredible control panel to manage the DNS, and you're done in 30 seconds. I mean, it is ridiculous. Like, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were reviewing Fedora, and I was like, well, I want to install MB on Fedora, but I want to have a name I can use for it all the time. Within 30 seconds, you guys, seriously, I have a server ready to go, I have a domain name registered, I'm in their control panel setting up all of the DNS stuff, and I'm done. 
and it is a super fast Linux server on demand. I can turn it off and on when I want it. You can even install applets right in your Linux desktop or on your smartphone to manage this. And if you use the promo code last digital, you get a $10 credit and you can stretch that crap out. Like you can really make this work. You have Linux infrastructure on demand, all using KVM SSD backends, and they have data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London. They got a brand new one in Toronto if you want to F the NSA, and they have a beautiful interface to manage all of it. It is really slick. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Last Digital. Get that ten dollar credit. Support our show. I have Sync Thing on one of mine right now, and uh, I had a little uh, I had a little Sync Thing support session before Tech Talk today. Because I got two of my rigs that were syncing and one of my rigs that wasn't. And, of course, somebody mentions, well, have you updated the other two machines and not updated? Oh, yeah, okay, that's what I did. I sent all that update. And here's the brilliant thing that I did, is I set my DigitalOcean droplet sync thing instance to be the introducer. So all I have to do is connect my other machines to that one single droplet, and it introduces all the other machines to all my other machines. It is a brilliant mesh network of syncing that feels like what I eventually have is a transparent network file system. I put something in one folder, boom, 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 boom. It's across all my machines, my droplets, my laptops, my desktops, no Dropbox, no backend cloud storage, all under my control. Last digital, you want to try it out two months for free. DigitalOcean.com. Try it out. I mean, it's pretty slick stuff. And you can see why I know when I have so many droplets that we're like droplet kings. DigitalOcean should be flying us around. I used my uh, I used my my droplet this week to uh, to entertain my son because he has no form of entertainment <laughs> at the house. Doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I I just turned on a hotspot, and uh, and why my kid knows about a hotspot is beyond me. But he knows about a hotspot, and so we turned that on, and he wanted to play on a game server, and of course the latency is horrible on most of them, and so I was like, well. We can just spin one up, right? And so it took me thirty seconds, yep. and for five bucks, he was entertained. I was like, ah, that's that's parenting money well spent. Yep, I've got Fedora twenty three because they've. I mean, that's the other thing about DigitalOcean, man. They're really on top of this stuff. Twenty three has not been out that long. They got Fedora twenty three with MB in a Docker container, all set up using Cockpit. And when my kids come over, boom, MB for you, son. There you go. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Last Digital. Go make yourself an X to go machine up in the cloud. I don't care. Just do something with it, Last Digital. And a big thank you, to DigitalOcean, for sponsoring. The Linux Action Show. Okay, Noah, are you ready to have your face blown off? I'm my well, no, yeah, actually. Well, because here up, we go. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm no, Noah, stop it I, right I'm, now. I, I'm kind of attached to my face, Chris. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, here's the thing: I have found a legitimate video editor for Linux that is more powerful than Lightworks. That is GTK that uses G, the latest GTK technologies, and it's available to run right now with one download, no proprietary account or any of that crap. All right, needed. blow my face off. Okay. I'm All right, ready. you've heard it before. It's P2V. You know what I'm talking about? P-I-T-V-I, right? P2V? P-I-T-I-V-I or something like that? Well, guess what, Noah? They just had a brand new version. They just released 0.95, and this is a huge, huge deal. I'm not joking. This is a really big deal, uh, and I have already, already installed it on my machine. I'm going to give you a little demonstration, Noah, because I could tell you about all the great things. But here's the problem. They've been essentially working on this release for over a year, and they've done so much work on this. It's, a, it's almost an entirely new product. It is basically, I thought about breaking down all the different stuff they've done, but they've restructured and re, they've redone everything. So I'm just going to show it to you instead. So uh, first off, uh, you know how Lightworks is a piece of crap and doesn't look anything like this? Well, this looks yes. like an actual video editor. And okay, that's I have, a good start yeah, with I your know. video editor. That is nice, right? I have right here a list of all of my available projects, plus I could do a new project, and it has uh, presets. You know, I have 1080p, 24 frames a second. I've also made a GoPro preset here, which is 1080p, mm -hmm. 60 frames a second, 16 by 9 ratio, sure. And you'll probably see noticing at this point, if you're watching the video version, this is all using GTK3, including client-side decorations, the latest goodness. We like all of that. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up a project that I've already been working on. It's called a quick tour with System76. I did this a couple of minutes ago on the pre-show. Okay. And a, a wow. couple, yeah, a couple of things that I want you to notice right away. Uh, you have multiple tracks here. You have my video track with the audio sort of broken out just like Final Cut 10 does it. This is mm -hmm. very much, if you're familiar with Final Cut 10, this is going to be a familiar editing interface for you. And so what I was able to do in about 5, 10 minutes on the pre-show is I created a title sequence, I added music, I duck the music when the video starts, I added two clips, and they have an automatic crossfade without me having to actually drag that transition down onto the clip, uh, onto the timeline. So just to give you a sample, I'm going to play it here. It's not perfect because it hasn't been rendered yet, but i uh, just give you a taste. Well, wait, hold a second. Hold on. And there. 
this is a quick tour of system. Well, hold on. Hold up. Oh, oh. Sorry. So, okay, hold on. Before I play, Noah, do you see over here on the uh, left-hand side? Watch this. I see little pink rolls. You can do you can do a little, uh, and I'll say also, I'll just feed back to the PDV project. If you have like a, a 2K monitor, uh, the project go, goes a little crazy on the way it sizes. But if you have a 1080p display like I have here on the Bonobo, uh, it actually it sizes itself quite nice. All right. So I've got, I've already added music. I've got my video clip here from the GoPro that I took at System76 last week. And I've just dropped them on the timeline. I've ducked the music before we hit start. And so the music, so there should be a title sequence created by, created by P2V. Then when the video sequence starts, the music should automatically go down, as I've told it to. And the music should play under the video, but it shouldn't be so loud that you can't hear the words. We'll see if that works. And not so much. You hear the music still a little loud. The frame rates mm -hmm. are dropping. So it's not a perfect editor. But Noah, mm -hmm. it is so, so close. If you get a little GPU acceleration here, you get a little, a little bit of these kinks worked out. You get the fact that I, I ducked that audio and the fact that I hit save and it didn't save that information that I ducked the audio. Like you fix those kinds of things. I actually think 85% of the type of clips we play in the show, 90% of the type of clips we play in the show could be handled with P2V. It's right here. It's no problem. And look at this. If I hit render, like I could make, I could go fix the audio issues here. And it's not so bad. Like I can zoom in and you can get in pretty close. And then if I click on the audio right here, It'll bring up, no, just kind of like in Final Cut, I can click right here, mm -hmm. and I can click right here, and then I can drag down. Now, if those things were fixed, would you use it to edit the rover logs? Hmm. You know, it's too slow still. It's still too okay. slow, but it's so close. It is. Okay. It's, it, it's in that range. It is. Uh, because I have two litmus tests. That's litmus test number one. Here's here's the final litmus test. This is like the end all be all. I will, I will put my NOAA stamp seal of approval of editing on Linux is fully functional when Rakai edits, edits a video on Linux. Oh, dude. Yeah, if I can convince him... No, it, listen, that If don't, I can no, convince no. him to edit a video on Linux, I can convince anyone no, to edit a video on Linux. That's not fair. No, no, that's not fair. Why? This, I think, if, if you come into editing video, mm -hmm. if you get yourself a cell phone, or you get yourself a GoPro, you get yourself one of those cameras that takes really great video like any digital camera does today, you, mm -hmm. you hook it up like I have right now. I have a little SD card reader that I've plugged the SD card in. These clips are literally playing off an SD card. Like, if that's your workflow, it's ready today for you. Okay. I mean, I honestly believe 80% of, 70% of our audience, it's ready today. You don't okay. need, you can just go download the binary. You don't need a, you don't need an RPM. You don't need a deb. Just go get it from their website, download the tar file and extract it. The binary runs right out of the folder. You could edit together your Christmas videos, your Thanksgiving videos today. And, and Rekai Rikai has to release 13 videos a week, and he has to mm -hmm, do it as mm -hmm. fast as humanly possible. And yeah. the faster he does it, the faster people can download, the more money the network works. It's not right. the same thing, right? So this is something you need. Like, if you got a great video of, of your kids seeing their room for the first time at the new house, and you want to put a title to it with a date, and you want to put a little music to it, you're done, man. It works today, okay. and it's better than anything you could have on the Mac. Now, you want to do anything sophisticated, you need GPU accelerated, you want color correct corrections, you want lots of transformations and all those kinds of things, and you want maybe, you know, integrated motion effects, it's not ready yet. But if you want to just throw together something from your cell phone, your GoPro, or your or your digital camera, uh, I think mm -hmm. it's actually better than anything you could get on the Windows platform because it's easier to use, it's free, and you just download it right now. You don't have to go get it from a store, you don't have to have an account anywhere, you can just go get it. I mean, so I, I wouldn't undersell it because I actually think it's the first time I've been sitting here on this show, or standing here, I guess it is it is, and mm -hmm. saying, this is something that somebody listening right now could go use and edit video and have good results with. I've never really said that before. See, uh, and maybe it's just because I, right or wrong, agree or disagree, I guess I believe that it has been true for a while with Lightworks. No, I don't agree. Yeah, I know, that's fine. You're welcome to disagree. No, because you, you see right here, I know you're, you, you have the video feed. You see right mm -hmm. here how it has the waveforms right there in the clips? Mm-hmm. That's the waveforms in Lightworks. Yeah, not like this though, where you can go in there and you can you can click on a section of the waveform and you can drag down and you're ducking right there, right? Mm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like yeah. it is. So it, I'm a, see what I is 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 I'm a human being and I see something right there and I want to click that thing and I want to move it. I want to manipulate that thing right sure. there. And that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean this. Uh, 
I, I will give you this. I've never, and and here's the thing. You you have been around me enough times and heard me talk about LifeWorks enough times. Have you ever heard me even remotely imply that LifeWorks is intuitive? No, no, no. I know. I agree. See, this is it, though. This is yeah, an intuitive. Right, right. This takes the simplicity of a modern GTK3 application, brings it to video editing, and mm-hmm. makes it available right now. Dude, on two different machines on in this network. I just downloaded this tar file, I extracted it, and I had my video editor ready to go. All right. Well, the next time That's I edit a video, I'm gonna. I, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's what I'm gonna do. The next time I edit a video, I'm gonna use. Is it Pitivy? Is that how we pronounce it? Uh, PDV, Pitivy. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they just. The, the thing is, they just had this big release. They just had. I mean, we've talked about this on the show before, but they just had mm-hmm. version 0.95, and this is a complete rework. This is a rework since they had their crowdfunding thing, which was semi-successful. And this is a big rework since they've had a whole bunch of transitions with GTK3. 198 quality tests out of 198 quality tests finally passed for this effort. 154 tests were written just for this release. They have new 100% GTK integration. It is nice. It is tight. It is not like any other version's ever been released. This is a whole new deal. I'm excited. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. I, I, I'm, I'll use it. The next time I do a video edit, and uh, and we'll see. Pi I guess that, TV. Be... Pi TV. Pi TV. Okay. All right. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't seem right. There's an extra I in there for it to be Pi TV. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm sorry I get excited, but. No, man. I'm glad you're excited about a video. Listen, this is one of the, this has been one of the fundamental things this people do saying. on their computers and be lacking in Linux for a long, long time. This is what I'm saying. All right, Noah. Well, uh, we have a uh, spotlight that I was shocked has never been covered on the show before because, honestly, if you had a tool bag that you could only fit a couple of tools in, like four tools, this would have to be, like, number two, right after ping. Nmap. (laughs) And Nmap version 7 was released this week, and this is a huge deal. And there's top seven improvements in Nmap 7. I don't care about all seven, but I'm going to give you a couple of them. Uh, New, brand new, fancy-schmancy scripting engine. The NSE engine is super nice. IPv6 support, not so bad. Not so bad. But uh, uh, really, what's what's really great about Nmap is if you have never tried Nmap before, this is a tool that is fantastic at scanning your network, finding what machines have ports open, and even doing um, a little bit of um, OS fingerprinting. And the number four feature of Nmap 7 is faster scanning. Nmap has continually pushed the speed boundaries but now it's even faster. Now, Nmap is 18 years old, if your face can believe that. And this release is no exception for improvements. The new engineers give performance boost to Windows and BSD systems. Target re, uh, reordering, they say, prevents a nasty edge case on, multiple hone, on multi-hone systems. And with the new plugin tweaks, you can also get much faster scans. And I think overall, Nmap is a must-have tool. Absolutely. You ever heard of it before, Noah? Have you ever heard of it no. before? No, no, no of course I've never, not. Never used no, Nmap before. Of course not. I, I wasn't using it thirty seconds, uh, thirty seconds before I before I uh, left to come here to do last to uh, to see which which box my uh, my one of the bo- one of the boxes that I don't want to describe on air that I'm just realizing now. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to do the sentence. Really? One of the boxes in my house. Oh. I wanted to find out what IP address it was, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't just use Nmap to to figure that out. And it's yeah. not something I use on an absolute daily basis. Yeah. In fact, it's funny. I install Ubuntu, and if it's if it's a machine I'm going to use for any length of time, the first the, one of the first things I do VLC and map. <laughs> yeah, and also as I keep pointing out in the chat room, a nice part of Nmap is NCAT, and uh, Nmap has uh, been around now. I just thought that was imar- remarkable for 18 years. Version mm-hmm. seven just now coming out, and uh, indispensable. And it's still not included in Ubuntu by default. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. my thought. But if you'd like to try it out, it's not too far away. It's in your local repository. And Noah and I both give it two big, enthusiastic thumbs up. If you want to find our previous picks, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash last picks. we got a whole bunch of good picks that will make your new Linux rig perfect. Or also your new Android device. Lots of good picks over there. And some fantastic open source spotlights that deserve your attention. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash last picks. But hey, guess what, Noah? Let's do the news. <laughs> the news and this episode is brought to you by ting.com everybody knows that go to last.ting.com las.ting.com that supports our show but also gives you a $25 discount off your first ting device or if you're going to bring a ting compatible device which you might be able to because they've got cdma and gsm you'll get $25 in service credit now that paid for more i'm going to say that again that paid for more than my first month of service at ting ting is mobile that really makes sense 
they uh, are just really straightforward, and that's what I love about it. It's your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. You just pay for that, plus the line for $6, and you're done. Just check it out, last.ting.com. They're not trying to manipulate net neutrality. They're not trying to get you to binge on more things. They just make mobile that makes sense, and I love that about Ting. Noah, I have three Ting devices, but I believe now, sir, you have probably outclassed me and then lapped me, and I don't like that at all. So what I am going to do, Noah, is I'm going to keep my eye out on Black Friday next week. Now, Ting has made no official announcement, but if I were trying to compete with Noah and I wanted to get a great deal on a Ting device, there may be a blonde little birdie that told me that Ting is going to have a 30% sale off their top devices on Black Friday. They'll have free shipping, and you should check it out at last.ting.com. Now, that's not an official word. I right. cannot confirm or deny these rumors, but I was told that by a little birdie. Last.ting.com. Check out the Ansatel One Touch Fling. This is a brand new feature phone, $63, no contract. Pay for what you want for what you use. A really nice, straightforward phone. You want something with a little more guts? Moto Nexus 6. $349 unlocked, no contract, pay for what you use on Ting. Isn't that sweet? They got all the good devices. From the basic feature phones, the MiFi's, and the latest and greatest straight from Google. You get the Google experience with no carrier BS unlocked. It's a great way to go. Linux is freaking awesome on there. I mean, that is finally, I mean, that is not, I mean, Android. Android is freaking awesome on the Nexus 6. It is not like the, uh, the janked up modified versions that you get when you go get it from some of the other carriers. It's just the Google experience. So you get all of the updates in their regular update cycle. Check it out. Go to last.ting.com. Go get our $25 discount off of your Nexus 6. Go see what I'm talking about. Also, why not keep an eye on the Ting blog? If you go to last.ting.com, you can go check them out. They've always got new stuff. You know, I'm a cord cutter, Noah. When I moved into the rover, mm-hmm. <laughs> am, I, am I gonna get cable television service in the rover? No. Uh, so I've doubled down on this, and Ting has actually had some great articles on this recently. But they also always have their app picks and all other kinds of good things, and they'll also have their Black Friday sales. Last.ting.com and check out their blog. Now I know, no, when you went on the road, did you bring a Ting device with you? Because I did. Heck yeah, I had two with me. I had my my Ting hotspot and I had my uh, my regular cell phone. I'd say here's oh. a Ting. Here's a Ting pro tip: if you want to shop for some Ting devices and you want them cheap eBay. eBay is your friend because you can ask the seller for the IMEI or the, uh, and and you can send that Mm -hmm. information to Ting and they'll tell you right away, yeah, that device, we can port that, it'll work, or no, don't get that device. Yeah, well, they have the CDMA and the GSM network, so you can pick and choose, and that makes it really nice because there's a whole range of devices you can bring over, and it really is cool. Last.ting.com. And I'm willing to bet that uh, it's probably been mm, almost a year since the deals have been this good. Last.ting.com, support the show, and go get yourself a great deal over at Ting. While we're talking about mobile devices, we should probably talk about Yala. This is the big story on Friday as we are recording the Linux Action Show episode 392. (sighs) I'm not pumped about it, but it's the truth. Uh, Apparently, the Yala project is going for some serious debt restructuring. Months after the smartphone company Yala announced its split and intent to focus on Sailfish OS licensing, its financial situation has not improved. Yala's latest financial financial round has been delayed, so they have to file for debt restructuring in Finland. As part of that, the company is temporarily laying off a big part of its personnel. Now we're going off some Google translations at this part, but from what, at this point, but from what we can tell, Yala's co-founder uh, said that our operating system Sailfish OS is in great shape and currently is commercially ready. Unfortunately, development at this time has required quite a lot of time and money, and they link to a PDF. To get out of this death valley, we need to move from de- the de- from a development phase into a growth phase. At the same time, we need to adapt our cost levels to the new situation. One of the main actions is to tailor the operating system to fit the needs of the different clients, <clears throat> carriers. We have several major and smaller potential clients who are interested in using Sailfish OS in their projects. Uh, And uh, uh, over on osnews.com, Tom has a great, great, great write-up. He seems to be pretty personally invested in following this as an old Nokia fan himself. And um, he says it, and I agree. No shit. 
Obviously, this was going to happen. Anybody with a little bit of foresight saw this one coming. Duh. And it's so damn frustrating that it still happened, even with crowdfunding, even with all of their different revenue sources, it still happened. And folks like Tom, who, who backed their project, even hours after it went for their tablet, is probably never going to get to see his hardware. And we all saw it coming. Admit it. We all saw it coming. Didn't you see it coming, Noah? Are you surprised by this at all? Um... I'll be very honest with you. I, I guess uh, everyone will just have to excuse my ignorance because I guess, no, I, I, I guess I didn't see it coming. I guess. Really? Uh, really? You didn't see, you didn't see Apple making billions of dollars a year. You didn't see Google making Android free to all of the OEMs and getting every OEM to snap it up. I did, but I also saw it, at, at a very strong level. I saw a lot of people at, at conferences that were really, really excited about yeah. self Well, I've been uh, seeing that about the Linux desktop for the last 15 years, dude. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and but the Linux desktop still exists, and it, it sounds like this is an entirely different ball game. This is a game where they go in, and people like Apple they buy out the Gorilla Glass for the next year, and people mm -hmm. like Google go out and they sign exclusive hardware agreements with Samsung, and they lock down the components mm -hmm. years in advance, man. And you look at this, and 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 we all thought, man, it, I think uh, Noah, if you're honest with yourself, mm -hmm. what the real answer is. You hoped they would. You 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 were hoping Yala was going to be different. Yes. You were hoping that if you're honest, Noah, I believe you pretty much were skeptical it was likely, but you thought maybe these are the guys they're going to buck the trend. Maybe they have a shot. Maybe they can do it. That's what I think. If you're honest, is what was going through your mind. I mean, I definitely thought that they were fighting an uphill battle, and it wasn't even. I mean, everything that you just outlined is a very well articulated, very accurate portrayal of of, of the uphill battles that. You know, a company that's going to make a new mobile device is facing, but really the, the big thing that I thought they were going to struggle with is adoption. And, you know, mm. if I'm a company and oh, I'm going to build an app. we're not even getting there, right? We're not, we haven't even gotten but there But I think yet. that's the biggest thing is if I'm, if I'm into it and I'm making GoPay, I'm making it for iOS and Android. If I'm Plex, I'm making a mobile client for iOS and Android. And so when you, and, and so the thing that I, that gave me hope was Sailfish and why I thought they might be the exception was because... You could run Android mm -hmm. apps on Sailfish, right, and I thought, right. well, that they've tackled the biggest hurdle, and so, um, so yeah, I guess I am a little disappointed that. Yeah, um, definitely that, disappointed. I mean, that's what's coming across to me right now is I'm I'm actually a little I'm a, a little I'm, I'm a, a little emotional about this because mm -hmm. uh, I see a market that is being dominated by Google and Apple, and uh, what I see happening is essentially. Open source project after open source project is throwing themselves on the sword trying to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us commentators are sitting here on the sidelines. Yeah, and we have the luxury of sitting here on the sidelines. And we're sitting here going, boy, I can't see any reason why that's going to work. And we're saying yeah. this two years before they commit suicide. And it's, it, it's, it is, I guess, at the end of the day, what I come to the conclusion of is maybe this just isn't something we should even bother with. Let Google and Apple and Microsoft spend billions of dollars creating toys that people who want to sit in front of televisions and pay half of their attention to use the device use, let them lock down that market. And why don't we focus on our core competencies as an open source community, as a, as the Linux, as, as a Linux operating system, let's focus on what we rock at. Let's focus on continuing to pressure desktop manufacturers to open source their drivers. Let's now continue to I make sure behind. the underlying hardware manufacturers have to open source their system on a chip the drivers mm -hmm. and, and firmwares. Let's apply pressure there and, and, and let the kids have their toys okay. to play Crossy Road. And let let Apple own Crossy Road. Meanwhile, the infrastructure of the internet and the fundamental underlying operating system, the powers these things, is where we have our leverage. Instead, yeah. what we do is we spend time on. I'm going to say it on Canonical's vision of making everything work from your phone, or Plasma's vision of Plasma Active, or what completely led the GNOME project astray until GNOME 3.12, where they thought GNOME and Linux was going to be used on touchscreens, which never materialized. And mm -hmm. instead of spending and wasting and spinning our wheels on chasing what the proprietary vendors are doing, we could be focusing on what we do genuinely have leverage. And instead... Things like Yala or the Ubuntu Edge phone or Convergence or Plasma Active continue to distract us from where Linux remains to have its power, where, where Linux remains to have its continuous user base. And to me, I look at this Yala story and I go, well, yeah, of course this was going to happen. None of us wanted us this to happen. A lot of us backed the projects hoping we would get a Yala tablet. 
And you guys don't even know this, but like Noah and I are walking around the streets of Denver and we're saying, well, geez, it seems like our only hope is Yala. I sure hope that crap works out because, mm-hmm. man, I really mm-hmm. have all my eggs in that basket right now. And yep. then you see this. It's not that we're not behind it, but it just was obvious. It was obvious. You know, and the, the, the thing is, is, you know, you talk about if we could leverage our strengths on the desktop. And you know what the funny thing about that is? Nobody else is concentrating there right now. Not very hard anyway. Microsoft is working on the whole Surface idea. Apple is concentrating on iOS. It seems like the big void in the computing area is the desktop. And part of that is because a lot of the new hipsters have moved on to tablets. Mm, No. Well, I I mean, yes, you're right. You are absolutely right. Except for I think that's a trend. They've moved on to tablets until they have to get anything done. So this, this, uh, no, I, that, I went, I went, no, hold on, man. I'm going to throw myself under the bus here. I went full hipster when I went to, when I went to Denver, mm-hmm. I went, I went full on hipster. I didn't, I didn't bring anything but an iPad. I will admit it. I have an old iPad that I've had for years. And I thought, well, if I get stuck on the airplane, maybe I'll watch some videos. I actually never pulled it out once on the entire trip, never even turned it on, but I had it in the bag just in case I wanted it. But I was like, I'm going to go full hipster, no mm-hmm. laptop. Mm-hmm. And then guess what? I had to get a PDF in my email, and I had to sign that PDF on like 15 effing pages, and then I had to scan that. P- I had to I had to print it all out, sign it, scan it back in, and email it back to some gal at AOL.com. And you know how I did that? Like a monkey at the System76 offices, I went and used one of their really nice uh, touch desktops. Yeah, you did. And I sat there for like 30 minutes and did my work because I didn't bring a computer with me like a big boy. Yeah, it's it's not it's not there yet. And so, yeah, these hipsters will tell you you can do everything from your iPad Pro with your new fancy keyboard or your Surface Book. But in reality, they're not developing a single application from any of those devices. They're going back to their desktops or their Intel based laptops. They're going back to their desktops to play video games. They're going back to their desktops to do inventory management. They're going back to their desktops to do any kind of any kind of orchestration at all with any kind of system. They're going back to their desktops to deploy servers. They're going back to their desktops to play video games. They're going mm-hmm. back to their desktops to do email. They're going back to their desktops to do spreadsheets, right? So the, the desktop and the laptops aren't going anywhere, regardless of the hipster mode that we convince ourselves in. And in the meanwhile... Apple, Microsoft, Google, they're all off in la-la land, pretending like the hipsters are all right, pretending like this is the future, and Linux is sitting here going, well, no, we'll just create iterating on, we're just going to keep iterating on a great desktop, we're going to create, we're going to make the GNOME environment better than ever, we're mm-hmm. going to make the Plasma desktop better than ever, we're going to make Unity, that possible desktop, so then when you're not wanting to type tapping up on the glass anymore, you can put it into a keyboard, and we're going to make that better than ever, we're going to focus on the desktop. There is, that is happening at the same time. You have efforts here, like Yala, which are completely chasing what the proprietary commercial vendors are doing. And I want to wrap it up on this. But here's why I think we will never, ever, ever win at this game. I don't think Canonical is going to have mass adoption at this game. I don't think anybody but but the incumbents can ever win. Because to win... At having a great mobile operating system, you got to have all of the major tent poles. You got to have the content deals with the movie industry, your Play Stores, your Microsoft Store, your iTunes Store. The bigger your ecosystem, the more you are entrenched. You got to have those deals. Nobody but the guys with the massive lawyers can do that. In order to go even further and to make sure things actually work, you got to control the whole stack. We were at System 76. I made this very point. If you want to make sure that you can take a phone and plug it into a dock and guarantee that once you plug that phone into the dock, Mm -hmm. the screen works perfectly, the keyboard works perfectly, the printer works perfectly, the remote desktop projection of like, you know, for presentations or a second monitor works perfectly. The only way you are ever going to get there is if you make the display chipset, you make the display driver, you make the CPU, you make the interface that connects the, the phone to the dock, that connects the dock to the, to the, to the monitor. The mm-hmm. only way you can ever guarantee that entire chain of taking a tiny 5-inch screen, plugging it into a dock, and having a 27-inch screen light up and have all of those peripherals work and have the processing power to make all of that work, the only way you can actually guarantee that's going to happen 
is if you control the entire stack. If a different vendor is responsible for each piece of hardware and software in that chain, it is never going to work. And the only way consumers will accept it is if that entire chain works. You take the phone, you put it in the dock. I.e., you got to be Apple, it's got to be Android One, or it's got to be Microsoft, where everybody signs on the dotted line. That's the only way this convergence system works. That's never a position Canonical is going to be in. That's never a position Y'all is going to be in. That's never a position anybody else but Apple, Google, and Microsoft will ever be in, and maybe Samsung. And if you want that world, then you go get yourself, have that at Haas, go have a convergent device. If you want a desktop machine that is powerful, if you want a laptop, then that's where traditional Linux has its leverage. So it's no surprise to me, Noah, at all, that y'all is having a hard time getting funding. And it is no surprise to me that people that sent their hard-earned learnings into y'all to fund a tablet are never going to get a tablet. Man, it yeah. super sucks. And I know the y'all people have their best intentions at heart. But at the end of the day, it is not the core power or leverage that open source or Linux has. We just don't yeah. have leverage there. We do not control the hardware stack. We don't have billions of dollars to buy out all of the glass. I cannot go buy PI Semiconductor and make sure that my distribution has a CPU built just for it. I am not Samsung. I do not control the entire manufacturing process. There is no way, if, unless that is you, there is no way to guarantee that works for consumers. And if that's not the position you're in, i.e. canonical, it's never going to happen. It's never going to work for y'all either. Yeah, I, I guess I I, I um I, I don't know uh, I uh, so so going going back just a little bit um it, it, so as far as you know we we can't get everything to work with you know with trust individual pieces to work could we not have standards you have a display standard that allows uh, the phone to talk out you have an input standard a human interface oh, yeah. device standard that yeah. kind of thing yeah yeah and 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 the, and, the, and the seven years it takes you to get there. Apple have shipped four products that have been doing that same exact thing in that entire yeah. four years, right? Because yeah. if you have complete control of that entire stack, you can implement the ideas unilaterally and it's, it's working, right? Apple rolls, out, Apple rolls out something called Handoff and the last three generation of Macs and the last three iPhones all support this thing called Handoff. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what the hell it does. A hand job, whatever. They all do it, right? <laughs> because they, hold, they, they own the whole stack. Meanwhile, how long have we been talking about convergence? I mean, I'm not... Whew, I guess I'm not trying to shit on the idea, but what I'm trying to say is if we focus on core competency, we can really kick ass. And if we really focus on areas where these proprietary vendors are not focusing, we can double down on an area that is not being addressed by them anymore, and we can draw people to our platform. That's the core message. I mean, all everything I've just said aside, my core rant is, the core thing I'm trying to get across is if we focus on a few key areas... These are areas that these proprietary guys are finally not focusing on anymore, and mm -hmm. we can really run with it. I definitely don't disagree that uh, that Linux should be concentrating on the desktop. You and I both know that that, I mean, you don't see me using Linux on a tablet. And, and the few times that I have tried to experiment with it, it has gone horribly wrong. And, and so I really think that I, I agree with you that that for, you know, for us as geeks, as power users, I think that the laptop form factor works really well. And I think that that's where Linux can succeed. However, that said, I know a ton of people, Chris, that live on their tablets and they don't go to a computer to get stuff done. And I don't know what those people would do in a situation like you where they had to sign those PDFs mm -hmm. and, and send them back. You know, and quite honestly, yeah. quite honestly, I can think of a, a few of them that would literally email it to somebody else and say, I need you to print this off because I yeah. need to sign it. And, and so... And Q5 in the chat room is also bringing up a producer. Q5 says, why do people want a phone uh, that can be a computer? Why not make a phone a tablet that can be a device or a computer? And I think that's really where convergence comes in. And I mm -hmm. think what, what for my argument to be correct, like the, the, the big truth you have to accept is forget all those users. Let them have okay. it. Okay. Because I think what my argument is, is iOS and Android and maybe Microsoft is already won those users and there's nothing we can ever do to get those users. Let them have it. Because you know what? There is still tens of thousands, if not millions of users that need real computers to do real work. And that will never go away. Just like the truck was never replaced by the car, just like the radio was never replaced by the television, just like the freaking dot matrix printer, like you and I were joking about, yeah, yeah. was never replaced by the laser printer, right? There are less dot matrix printers, but dude, 
You and I were laughing this yeah. week. There yep. are still dot matrix printers in That's production. True. We saw them printing that them out. True. Th- yep. And and you know what? They make a pretty penny, and it is a good business to be in. Mm-hmm. And people make their entire living selling stupid freaking dot matrix printers. I don't think anyone's ever going to do AutoCAD on a tablet. I don't think that anyone is is ever going to do you know large scale video editing on a tablet. I don't. I mean, there are definitely certain tasks that I think are very oriented towards computers, but I think that the lar- that that the that the large market, the mass uh, majority of users, if with a couple little tweaks, could could get by on a tablet if they so choose. And I'm not saying I think it's a better. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know. almost did. I almost did for a week. Right. I almost did. And if you if you're really desperate, you could have probably muddled through the whole PDF thing. I had my phone. You know, I, I mean, I, did, I mean, I never even bust out the tablet. Basically, I did everything from the phone. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when it came down to signatures, I just I wanted I wanted more space. I yeah. wanted to I wanted to go into work mode. Right. I, you know, I, I left review and and um, triage mode, and mm-hmm. I went into actually get things done mode. Yep. And when I made that shift, all of a sudden, then I needed an x86 processor. Yep. Then I needed the entire package availability of Ubuntu. I needed the HP printer drivers. Like, boom. Like, it just changed everything for me. I mean, it was a complete perspective change. We definitely agree, if nothing else, that... Linux's real strength and focus should be on the desktop. And it's like you so eloquently put it earlier, that is right now where not a lot of manufacturers are focusing. And it's so it's a place where Linux has to shine that it hasn't already. And if we could have the same success on, I would gladly, gladly let uh, Google and Microsoft and Apple duke it out over the mobile device. If we could be the predominant platform right. on the laptop and the desktop. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm saying. Let them, let them punch each other in the nose over and over again. Let them just go at it, right? Uh, and here's why, because we're actually getting serious on the Linux desktop. I don't, I'm surprised, honestly, no, they're not going to call this uh, GTK um, 4.0. Uh, but right now, in GTK Plus 3.19.2, they, I, I could be completely misreading this, so big disclaimer here, but they are doing what appears to be the final touches to make GNOME extensions and GNOME themes stable between releases. So GTK 3.19.2 has CSS nodes for the GTK, uh, if you look at GTK Inspector and like start looking at things, it shows that the CSS nodes support for native file choosers on Windows using when GTK, I'm reading the Pharonix article here, they also have uh, support now for GTK file chooser native APIs and changes to the GTK file chooser have been improved, but the big improvement is about the CSS space. Red Hat developer, Explain that the new CSS nodes work as a CSS node is an element name, a state that can have a style and a class. Now, I don't know anything about this, but my understanding is you could say things like this element in the GNOME 3 UI or this specific thing in the GNOME 3 UI. It's specific classifications that will now remain stable between GNOME updates. So when GNOME 3. whatever comes out, these particular elements will remain stable between the individual releases. This is a big, big deal. The transition to CSS nodes is mostly done in GTK plus 3.19.2. In the second step, they'll integrate CSS CSS nodes into the size allocation and rendering. That sounds really fancy to me, Noah, and what I'm understanding is, hopefully, we're going to have some stabilization here for these plugins, extensions, and themes. That would be awesome. That That would would be be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Since we're talking about GTK and some crap that I barely even understand, let's talk about something that is a little more practical, a little more in your face right now, That is the Plasma 5.5 beta release. Now, here's some actual genuine improvements you can go get your mouth on right now. A new Breeze Plasma uh, updates for the icons and widget themes so everything looks real nice and consistent. A new color picker. And also, a new user switching agent has been updated. Now, if you click on the little thing here, you get a real nice user switcher applet. And also, in the lock screen, you get there too, as well as their full name, the user's avatar. You can switch between different user sessions. And now, Noah, you... uh, System administrators can lock down users hardcore. Plasma 5.5 sees a new applet designed for business environments or, you know, universities. This hour, maybe podcast production shops. This applet will show your usage based not on the actual disk usage, but on your quota allowed by the system administrator. And in response to a lot of feedback, they've rewritten support for legacy applications using the status notifier standard. So if you had an old app like Dropbox, Spotify, XChat, Pigeon, Skype, that wasn't working correctly with your Plasma notifications. They've reworked the system trace support, 
and they've implemented support for that old way of doing it in the new Plasma 5 desktop. That is a big deal. You're going to get legacy system tray icons now in the Plasma 5.5 beta. I think that's really nice. And then also, a shout out to Martin for all of the extremely hard work with Plasma 5.5 to get basic Wayland sessions. And also, a new screen management protocol has been created for configuring and connecting screens of Wayland sessions. Also added are some protocols for controlling KWIN effects in Wayland, such as Window Background Blur and Windows Minimizing the Animation. Uh, Plasma on Wayland sessions now features secure locking. Also, something that was never fully achievable on X. So it's kind of a big deal. A huge Plasma 5.5 beta has just been released this week. You guys can go check that out. And uh, also, last but not least, for guys like Noah and I who are traveling, several, several, several improvements to the new Network Manager applet. Ah. Yep. WPA and WPA2 Enterprise Validation was added. It also uses a new password field and support for OpenVPN. Man, Noah, I know you had a little bit of experience with Plasma 5.5 a few weeks ago. Or, I mean, uh, Plasma 5.4. I mean, yeah. when five five hits final, we should probably do a like a like an episode. Yeah, you think? We'll have to take a look at it. You know, the thing is, I'm really interested to see what happens with the network manager in specific. The more hyper sense or the more tuned I become to like paying attention since we've been doing distro reviews. You know, I use uh, I use Linux from a if it boots and I can see what I'm doing and I'm connected to the internet. I call that a win because when I first started using Linux, that was a considerable amount of effort to get those three things to happen. And so, <laughs> I, so, so I, I take a lot of this, I, I probably don't take a lot of stuff for granted that, that most people do, but since we've been doing reviews, I've become hyper aware and tuned yeah. to things. Yep. And there are a lot of little tiny irritating problems with network manager. And, uh, you know, yeah. it was like, like even when I was at the hotel, it would keep dropping the Wi-Fi network, but my phone wasn't doing that. It would, my phone was connected yeah. solid. And so, and I'm you not paid for wait, hold on. You paid for Wi-Fi? Yeah. One of the nights. Oh my god, dude! It was like seventeen bucks for one night of Wi-Fi. I know, but I had—I don't remember what it was the night I was moving. I, something I was doing was extraordinarily data intensive, and I would have yeah, paid five man. times that to dude, do it on my I set spot, up an so. Oryx Pro and I prepared for the Linux Action Show. I mean, I, I did that. I did that over tethering. Cause, I mean, it, you guys, it was seventeen bucks a night for data. Anyways, soldier on. Sorry. Yeah. I'm anyway, just, I'm just uh, shocked, so, shocked. so anyway, so there are little little irritating issues with. Um, there are little irritating issues with network manager that yes. I like to improve, but yes. you know the last time I used a uh, plasma, uh, last time I used plasma, I guess the thing that kept coming, I kept coming back to is this would go over so well in some of the more, how, how shall I say politely, hip businesses that we do work in mm. that they're all about making everything look pretty and they couldn't really yeah. care less if it's you know you can get work done easily. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. All right, well, you know what? Since you just said that, let's shift gears and go way under the hood. Let's go down to the nitty-gritty. Let's go to the ugly bits. The Linux Kernel 2015 Summit just wrapped up, and uh, Jonathan Colbert um, of LinuxWeekly.net went out there and did some really seriously good reporting. Um, I mean, uh, just a little, just a round of applause for Jonathan. Um, we very rarely see genuinely good reporting in the Linux community where they actually go out and get the story, and Jonathan went out and actually got the story from Linux Kernel Summit this week. And if you're not an LWN.net subscriber, uh, I honestly think you might consider it because it is just really nice to have somebody who's doing some genuine journalism in the Linux community not to generate clicks. Anyways, he's got the full summary of all of the good stuff that you might want to read about, including uh, running the main Linux kernel on a cell phone and things like that. But a couple of things jumped out at me, Noah, that I wanted to cover right here on the show. Specifically... There's been some discussion around creating power management knobs for Linux. Uh, Raphael started off his 2015 keynote summit session by noting that every generation of hardware promises more power efficient than the predecessor, but it effectively never really happens. In an ideal world, systems should run in the most power efficient mode whenever possible, and only the less power efficient mode should be used when performance requirements demand it. But real-world systems tend not to run as efficiently as they can. Raphael came with a proposal he thought might improve the situation, but it's not clear if the idea will be implemented. Any hardware, be it CPU or a peripheral device with multiple operating states, has to be able to detect when it's safe to change between modes. Almost all hardware has some power-related modes that it's able to employ, but increasingly, power-efficient operation is not something the device can choose independently from the rest of the system. And as it happens, 
devices are often configured not to use the lower power modes. Think your laptop, your cell phone. Think Ubuntu Touch. Think Yala. This configuration is done really for a number of reasons, but it most often comes down to safety. Some hardware can misbehave when running at low power states, and the consequences of a misbehavior can be severe. You know, a lot of users have very high expectations. And sometimes there are legitimate performance concerns that argue against the use of low power states. Power management configuration can be tricky. There are lots of knobs in the system that can affect it in one way or another. There is usually at least one kind of knob for every kind of driver, often more for each driver, and few users even know how to find all of these different kinds of knobs, much less configure them properly. Raphael would like to make it easier for users wanting to tune their systems for power use. To that end, he has proposed the addition of a high-level switch in the Linux kernel that would enable Linux power management globally. This switch would be a command line parameter set at boot. Since it would need to be run at a boot time, it would affect the entire system. This switch would have two obvious settings, performance mode and power mode. There could be a setting to enable power management settings that are even still experimental. Brave users could turn these on. There are concerns, though, expressed by some of the attendants of a boot time switch, since it can't be changed with the power top utility and other utilities, and developers suggested that rather than adding a global knob, developers should make it easier for users to discover a set of power management options, which is probably, which is probably a very age-old uh, argument. Uh, now, uh, Darren Hart suggested that a global power management policy might be implemented uh, in user space. If all of the relevant settings were standardized, discoverable, and well-documented, Raphael pointed out that the runtime power, man power management knobs that were already standardized are not being taken advantage by users and are often set to disabled. Now, Noah, we continue to notice things like power management when we review Linux distributions and we don't talk about it very often. In fact, what was it that Carl said was the biggest thing that is his competition with the MacBooks? He and I were talking to you off the record and he said, what? Say it again. Say it again. Battery life. Battery life. He said the number one thing I cannot compete with the MacBooks on is battery life. But he said they were getting close. Uh, what do you think about like uh, some big, huge knobs, like some buttons that you push somewhere in your UI or on like, or maybe it's like, you know, maybe it's a grub option. Let's just go with a grub option. Say, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just, I'm going to propose it to you. At you, you, you power on your system and in grub you have super powerful mode and low power mode. Is this acceptable to you and what do you think? It's acceptable to me and I think it's a good idea, but I, I think that we have gotten kind of lost in what the actual problem is, and that is, if you take a MacBook apart, the entire bottom of the computer is not a computer. In fact, it's a it's gigantic a battery, battery yeah. and then there is like two inches by six inches that is the motherboard and hangs off the back end of the battery that they call the laptop. That is fundamentally why, I, at least in my humble, you know, know-nothing technology experience, why the MacBook battery is going to be so much longer than if you take my ThinkPad apart... There is a battery, and it's not even really a battery cell because you eat up a lot of space because you have to put it in a user removable, mm -hmm. uh, you know, style, uh, you know, chubby thing that right. sticks in the back. And so essentially, what you're left with is this big bulky thing that is like half the battery capacity of 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 what is is in the MacBook. And so I think that is we have to start there, and then we can layer some of these power management things on top of it. But uh, it, and, and so that that's the full answer. Looking at power management in and of itself, yes, I think that's great. Everything that we can do to squeeze out every little bit of energy out of the laptop is great, especially when you, you and I are doing things like sitting in an airport connected to Wi-Fi and browsing Facebook. There's no reason that we can't throttle things down a little bit, you know, and, 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 and cut out some unnecessary system resources to make that happen. Hmm, good point. And you know, you actually nailed it, right? It is, it's, it's not just, it's not all a software problem. It's not all a hardware problem either. And I wouldn't mind some of these knobs, but in reality, there's a lot of other issues we have to address first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, take the back of a laptop apart and look at it. I mean, 80% of it is fans and heat sinks and parts of a motherboard and wires running everywhere. And it just, it is, it, it, it you know, then the thing is, manufacturers are constantly looking two ways. I'm really glad that my new ThinkPad, they put a lot of money and effort into making this stupid click-click keyboard and doubling up on function buttons that make no sense. I'm glad that we're spending money and time and effort doing nonsense like that. I would rather them spend time, effort, and money 
finding out a way to shrink their freaking motherboard down so I can have more battery in there. That's mm-hmm. what we need to change. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. we need to fix. I also recommend you guys go check out the uh, benchmarking and performance trends. I'll have it linked in the show notes. It's available right now. Facebook is running on mostly uh, Linux 4.0 kernels on 30% of its systems. The company currently applies about 90 patches on top of that, which is actually considerably low by the industry trend. Uh, on They say, oh, by the way, performance has been fantastic. The multi queue block layer code has made a significant difference for them. They continue to test ButterFS. However, Facebook is worried there may be running into some scheduler issues that could be providing some sort of CPU latency problems. The problems are in the wake-up code, they think, that lead to less than optimal CPU use and latencies. They've put a patch into the 4.3 kernel. They hope it improves things. However, OpenSUSE's engineer took the stage. His name is Mel, and he says that from his point of view, it's not a scheduler issue at all. His biggest complaint instead was the Intel P-State driver, which handles CPU frequency and voltage management on Intel processors. He says the driver is making poor decisions. The CPU never seems to go above the minimum frequency on lightly loaded machines. With results that look like a 10 to 20% scheduler performance regression like Facebook could be seen. Basically, due to this faulty P-State driver. This is, he said, a serious issue. At a point that we are extremely efficient at doing nothing, but not so good at actually doing any work. As a result, he says, a lot of users are recommended to disable the P-State driver altogether. Mel closed with a problem that looks like a kernel performance regression, but isn't. Get this one, Noah. Ready for this? It seems that SystemD is configuring system demons into the same control group, which causes them to compete against each other under the block I.O. compiler. Or, I'm sorry, controller. It is, he said, a user space configuration error that can hurt performance. So there's a bug in systemd that ships with SUSE Enterprise Server that is coalescing all of the system processes into the same control group. Then they are all competing for disk I.O. competition with the scheduler. So uh, basically, the problem is, is that systemd is lumping everything together right now from the system, and it's hurting performance. That is causing major problems from the SUSE camp. Kind of interesting. I mean... This is a lot of information to parse, but what I'm getting at is Facebook says, hey, I think this problem is, 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 a, is an issue in Linux. And then somebody on the SUSE engineering team comes along and says, actually, that's an Intel issue with their P-State driver. But there is an issue completely unrelated with SystemD that's allocating all of your system processes into one C group, and then they're all competing for disk I.O. Like a whole lot of things coming out from the Linux kernel driver summit, but essentially what it is is like, the kernel itself looking really good, but system D or this particular driver by Intel, they're having some problems. You know, the, this the, the thought process was started in my head back at System 76 when we were, you know, off camera, we were having a conversation about it. But did we rush System D maybe just a little bit to a lot bit? Yes. I mean, if you yes. think about it, if you think about it, the amount of importance that System D has and the fact that and the fact that. It doesn't even seem like it's really even a completed project. It seems like it's a it's an ongoing, uh, essentially yeah. almost like a beta I think, level. I think thing. the bigger question you have to ask is, I mean, because the answer is obviously yes. Because just look at the date. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm a fan of System D. I think it's the right direction to go. I agree. I think it was. I think if you look at things like Inter- Red Hat Enterprise Linux Seven, I think it was too soon. I think that. So what the question you really should be asking me right now is, why did Red Hat Enterprise Linux Seven ship it? And why did they also ship things like Docker 0.9? Oh, what? They called it 1.0? They called Red Hat pressured the Docker project to call Docker version 1.0 so that way they could justify shipping it with the latest version of Red Hat. In fact, Red Hat just announced they've, they're doubling down on Docker with the new Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.2 this week. Doubling down on Docker. It's still a premature product. It's still not production ready. And they ship systemd. I think what you should be asking yourself is why is your beloved Red Hat rushing? And here we are judging, here we are, ah, here we are judging Ubuntu for just getting around to systemd and just making the transition from upstart when you know what? These very performance benchmarks show you that systemd is still new code. I think yeah. the bigger question is, is why is your beloved Red Hat shipping something that isn't ready for the server yet? So I, I, we can talk about the, the systemd thing. I think that the, the Docker thing is a little bit of a different story. And I'm not, that this is not my original thought. I'm stealing it from the conversation we had earlier. I'm just bringing it into the show for purposes of discussion. But 
Docker is is an optional thing. You don't have to use Docker with right. Red Hat. Yeah, that's a, you that's have a fair to point. Use fair system. point. No, it's not, and yeah. it's not mine. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm, right. I'm no, 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 no. You're but, right. You're right. There. You're, that is a good qualification to make. You could you could employ the latest version of Red Hat per, Enterprise Linux and never use Docker, and it never would impact you at all. And so I don't have I don't have a good uh, a reason or justification for why uh, why we jumped into System D so fast. I I think that it it, it feels it like to me, Noah, that the Fedora the Fedora mentality. Mm -hmm leaked into the enterprise distro you know ship it test it get users reporting bugs figure out what's wrong and fix it on the fly that somehow right. leaked its way into the world's largest well most trusted enterprise distribution so i wonder did it leak its way in or was it that we got to a point where we were so desperate to get startup times and server i mean we literally had startup times of, of 60 60 seconds to, to to two minutes and we've and we've dropped that down to you know 15 20 seconds i mean we've considerably shortened boot time and so at some point we do have to continue really? to move forward well, no. I, we did. I mean, it how, did. and and how and how often do you reboot your servers? Well, yeah, there's yeah. that. And and the thing was, is Upstart was working code that That's was true. stable and shipping in Red Hat That's Enterprise true. Linux six. That's true. Um, it just it seems like there was a little bit of competitive landscape at play shaping the decisions here. Yeah, and 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 be as whatever. I mean, I think long term it's good. I just. Red Hat, I, I wouldn't want to be the guy deploying Red Hat Enterprise Linux seven right now. I think I'd be pretty, I'd, I'd be pretty solid waiting to Red Hat Enterprise Linux eight, and, and letting Red Hat Enterprise Linux six continue to run for a while. Yeah. And I look at this and I think, if you know, and I'm, I'm not talking about Jupiter Broadcasting scale. I'm not talking about Alta Speed scale. I'm talking Facebook right. scale, right? right? I'm talking yeah, Facebook absolutely. scale. That's where it makes the difference. Well, yeah, for most actually, of us, honest, for, though, for most of us, it doesn't matter. You know what though? That's you know you say that, but the the truth is, I haven't gone to to I haven't deployed Rails. Well, I haven't deployed Rails seven by choice. I've had some. I've 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 been in certain situations where I I was required to. We were required to use Rails seven because that's what you know what had to be done. But if if I was asked for my recommendation for the things that we're doing or for the things that we recommend to clients, uh, we've still been deploying Rails six. But then again. I'm a slow mover. It's weird that you're taking that stance and I'm taking this stance, isn't it? Are yeah, it is, isn't office? it? That is kind of funny. We're reversed we're, we're for the day. Ooh, I like it. It must be the full moon. All right, so moving on. This is something that's pretty exciting for those of you who've been just like kind of waiting on those last few uh, Windows games to switch to Linux. Now, QMU, uh, let's play a word association game, Noah. You just say the first word that comes to mind. When I say QMU, you think? I think uh, virtualization. Oh, okay, good. That's good. That's not bad. That's not bad. Good. That's better than what I think. When I think QMU, I think slow. Uh, that's what I think when okay. I think of QMU. Right. But no, 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 no. That would be old school thinking. In fact, some of the highlights for QMU 2.5 include Zen support code now supporting pass-through of Intel integrated GPUs. In fact, Vert IO GPU now supports 3D mode, and VHost now support live migration. Now, buckle up. One of the changes that Phronix and myself are most excited about. Yeah, Michael Arbrell is so excited. He wants to tell you, and I want to tell you too. Get ready for this. QMU side of the work supporting 3D with Vert IO GPU pass through, starting with Linux kernel 4.4. .4. Yeah, for those of you who are not running Arch, you're going to have to wait a while for that one. Kernel 4, Gen 2. Kernel 4.4 is now has support for the new DRM driver, which is direct rendering management, not digital rights management, for supporting Vert IO GPU DRM with 3D support. What did I just say? In other words, you can play virtualized games. 3D pass through to your GPU in your virtual machine. So you install, let's say, Windows 7, because every other version of Windows since then has sucked horrible balls. You install Windows 7. You can get 3D support in your Windows guest and play your games in QMU. This has been possible for a while now, but it requires following a whole bunch of guides. Was 3D pass-through a thing, or was it PCI pass-through that then subsequently allowed you to do uh, 3D? You got to have your. I think you probably got to have a certain class of Intel CPU that does okay. the device pass-through. So you kind of have to have right. that. I'm yeah. Yeah. Right, but that's what I'm saying. This, so this is this is different, though, right? Because this is no this isn't passing through just the. I mean, essentially, right. PCI pass through, which no, is passing through the graphics card. This, this is something different, right? This is this is full like uh, GPU. You know, virtual machine can talk directly to the GPU through the CPU yes. 
You can right. do full 3D rendering. You can play DirectX games in a Windows VM. Boom, it's magic. It's gorgeous. Yep. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, that's awesome. I think it's pretty like cool. To play games anyway yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you like to play games... The thing is, if this is super, if this is super important to you, you've probably already figured out a way to do this because it is possible today to do this under Linux. You just got to dig around online. However, it's, nice it's, to have actually. It. Hold on a second. That's that that is woefully understanding it. You have to have specific hardware, and I mean yeah. a very specific hardware, and it it's takes true. hours, hours to set up and then troubleshoot to get working. And even then, it's it's not yeah, yeah. horribly great. Yeah, but yeah. If you can do all that, then you can yeah. kind of get a game to work. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice that Kimmy is going to bring it right to you, right, right in your face. Uh, and it just it just means that if Wine doesn't work for you, or there's not a native Linux port at this point, which is getting less and less likely, then you have one more avenue now to play games. Or what I'm really excited about is, and I'm going to wait and see, I'm going to wait for, to hear how it works for the audience, things like AutoCAD now, like you could install a VM, Ooh. right? Run AutoCAD and just get that 3D accelerated environment for AutoCAD and then go back to using Linux for all your other stuff. That could be a really big deal. And so you have a chance to tell us how what you think. Go to over to Linux Action Show at Reddit.com. It's also a place to submit news stories. If there's something that didn't make it in the news lineup this week, it probably didn't get enough votes. Linux Action Show at Reddit.com. It's also probably one of the best places to just get news on Linux in general. There's like about all right. I mean, let's let you know what? Let's find out right now. I won't even I won't even guess. I'm gonna go there right now. Linux Action Show You can go there too. Linux Action Show when Reddit's not down. And there are oh well, I'm really glad because I was gonna say seven thousand people that are um, helping us pick the news stories, but that would be that would be wrong. There are nine thousand two hundred and eighty nine users over on the Linux Action Show subreddit that are helping us make the world's best Linux podcast, and you can get involved. Linux Action Show. Dot reddit dot com. And that's all the news for this week. It's time after many, 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 many emails to talk about Solus, the Linux distribution built from scratch right here on the big show. We're going to give you our first impressions of this interesting desktop with its bungee desktop, which is not like GNOME. No, no, not like GNOME at all. But first, let me tell you about our segment sponsors. That's System76. They build powerful computers to help you do more, go further, and unleash your potential running Ubuntu. Yeah, we just came back from System76. And man, one of the things I loved, loved this System76 said is they realized people could always use more computing power. Not less, not weaker computers that do less. They always want more. Like the new Oryx Pro, which is a sweet rig available for pre-order right now. Go check them out, System76.com. And tell them. It's pretty slick. So, no, you and I have been perched on the edge waiting to review Solus or Sol OS, depending on right. how you read it. But we keep waiting because it was delayed. It was delayed. And you might remember it as, oh, wait for it, Evolve OS. But there was some issues with the naming. They had to transition to a new name. We had them on Linux Unplugged. We discussed the entire drama. And now here we are many months later with their RC1 release. And it is like Linux, but completely new. It's not based on any distribution. It's not an Ubuntu derivative. It's not based on Fedora or OpenSUSE or anything like that. Completely built from scratch with its own Bungie desktop. No, it's slick, it's minimal, and it's clean. It also has its totally own unique package repository. Did you get a chance to try it? I did. So, uh, it, it, as some of you may or may not be aware, I actually was moving this week, and so I had no internet at my house, and I had no spare computers because they're all packed up in boxes. So, uh, I was able to down. I, I went to download the daily, and the daily didn't work for me. The, I don't know if it, it for or forward. And so I ended up with RC1, and I'm not sure if that's the, the, the same one you tried yep, or not. Yep. Um, but I, I did get it installed. The, the thing is, the fact that it's not based on any other distro, for whatever reason, and I know this is I know this is asinine of me to say, but it feels more like we're actually reviewing something different this time. Yeah, buddy. You know? You know, because I mean, if if you have something that's that's simply based on Ubuntu, it's essentially like somebody chose a desktop. They manage they some like, packages. And, and they put some. They put yeah. some default packages in, and yeah. it's like, oh look, it's a new distro. Yeah. And that, that doesn't really do much for me. This is kind of cool. I, I be. I'll be very honest with you. I'm still not. 
I'm still not sold on. I, I haven't found that. Aha. That's where I would use that. That hasn't clicked for me yet. Um, but I'm still looking. So it is. Uh, it is a pretty unique experience. It's based on uh, GTK 3.16, GNOME 3.16. So uh, underneath the hood, uh, you you will get some familiar GTK applications. The Bungie Desktop has their own packages with their own software center that I'm showing you on the screen right now. They also include their own menu system. This menu system includes a search at the top, and then they break out each particular category in a flat menu. Extremely easy, extremely accessible to the end user. They have a very, very nice GTK theme, which I'm going to get to in a little minute, so just hold your horses before we get to that. I want to talk about that more on its own segment. They have the Bungie desktop environment. The Bungie desktop environment is its own unique take on GNOME 3. They've completely brought together their own components. So you have the Bungie settings here where you can, from one little bit of a click, turn on the dark theme. You can modify your widget theme from the arc darker to something else. You can manage your applets, your menu, and your panel from one spot. You getting this? It's a little bit different. Everything shows up as an icon down in the running tray. It's nice, it's clean, it's simplified, it's super focused, and it's very, very minimal. That's the Bungie desktop. Here's the problem with SoloS, and I really like these guys. They're super good. They've, they've been working really hard. Some fans of the show are working on something unique, and I really respect what they're doing here. But here's the problem. I can hit minimize right here. And this is my GNOME desktop. And this is using the Arc theme. This can look exactly the same as the Bungie desktop. So they've got to really walk a very, very tight line here between offering me something unique and simple, but yet differentiated enough from upstream GNOME. And I, I have yet to really capture if they're doing that, because one of the things you have as a brand new distribution, one of the things you have to just accept is a limited set of packages, a limited set of community adoption, and a limited set of reach. And that's where they're right. at right now with the Solus project. Now, if, right. you, if you are accepting all of that, Noah, I think they got something kind of interesting here that looks different from everybody else. And uh, what did you think of the installer? Like just getting it off and just getting it loaded on your machine. Was it yeah. neat? Was it nice? Was it different? No, yeah, it was, it was straightforward. It was, uh, you know, um, I, I guess if nothing, nothing of particular note uh, came to mind, but the, the, uh, where I, you know, kind of where I pictured uh, using Solar S or, or how I would have liked to review it. Maybe if we ever do a full on review review rather than just kind of like a first look, this is what I would do is it would be kind of nice to install it on a machine and pretend as if I had walked into a store and bought a machine with that uh, with with that operating system installed, and just run it as if I can't I I didn't know how to reinstall yeah. it. Or I couldn't reinstall it. Or I couldn't go to another distro and see how much leverage I can get out of it. See how much mileage I get out of it. I'll tell you my impression. You know, getting it installed on two machines for this review was it's early mm -hmm. days. Uh, it's early days, and I think if you accept that about this project, you're good. And they are not they're not they're not trying to deceive you. They all, they're upfront about the fact that it's early days. In fact, they've had a very nice blog series about, I think they're number 10 right now, about installing Solo S and just using it. Like, they're very clear about where they're at right now. So don't have any misconceptions here. But if you accept where they're at right now, their installer is starting from a very simple premise, one that I think is actually right in line with Antergross. Very nice, very clean, very straightforward, but limited at this point in time with some obvious room for expansion. I'll give you... A very straightforward example. You want to partition your disk? Go ahead. Click this partitioning button. It launches Gparted. Then you're presented with a blank disk. Have at it. Partition away. Make all the partitions you want. Make a home partition. Make a var partition. Make an opt partition because you're a boss. Make a boot partition. Make a swap partition. Make a var partition. Have at it, Haas. And then you hit apply. You hit save. You go back to the installer. You know what you can do? You can, inside, you can assign a root partition, and you can assign a swap partition, and that's it. You got to go make the partition separately, and those are the only two you can assign. It's early days. It's limited. It's just meant for testing, okay? If you can accept those limitations, what you are getting in exchange for that is a brand new distribution built from scratch, built around GTK for the desktop, so you get all your favorite GTK applications without the overhead of GNOME 3. It feels to me when I use it a little bit leaner, a little bit lighter, and a little bit quicker. At the same time, 
I don't have the vast repository that I am used to with Arch, OpenSUSE, Fedora, or Ubuntu. Did you get that impression? I, I did. You know, the, the last part really rings true to me. Usually, I am all over a distro when they find a niche to concentrate on. So, for example, if you make a distro that specializes in in-car media, or you make a distro that specializes in a Pixie server, you make a distro that, you know, whatever, you pick something that is that is that is a niche need that we need, you know, it, it needs to be more of an appliance rather than just a general purpose operating system, and you concentrate on it and you nail it. That to me seems like that project has a lot of life. And so I guess my question um, uh, to the Solus people would be, what is it we are trying to capture? Are we going after something, uh, some specific set of users, subset of users in specific, or are we looking for a, a general purpose desktop Linux? And if we're looking for a general purpose catch-all, uh, every user should use this day-to-day -day daily driver Linux distro, then my mm -hmm. question becomes, why why would i use a why would i use this over something like ubuntu or fedora or arch or any of the other distros that have been around for a long long time and have a lot of software availability yeah and i and that's where i'm at right now you know the end of you know mid november that's where i'm at you you talk to me again next november and i think i'm going to have mm -hmm. a completely different opinion okay so why i think is that i think in a year from now my opinion will be well if you have taste this is probably the desktop for you I don't know if it's there yet. Like, I think what they're offering here is like it's it's elementary OS done better, more modern. Not to da not to damn the elementary OS guys, but you know we're talking modern GTK stuff here. Mm -hmm, we're talking mm -hmm. we're talking real nice current GTK stuff, and we're talking stuff that really is moving quite quickly. Not at the same pace as elementary OS. I think if you if you're not happy with GNOME, but you like GTK applications, uh, I think maybe in a year from now. XFCE users might be looking at this desktop. I think in a really? year from now, yeah, I do. I think in a year from now, people that aren't liking Unity 8 could be looking very seriously at the Bungie desktop. And I think that's where they're, they're laying down the groundwork today. I think that's where they could be next November, essentially, is kind of, yeah. what, I'm, is, is kind of what I'm thinking. Do you think I'm crazy? No, no, not at all. And and here's the thing: I don't want anything I say to come off as I, I'm, you know, I'm rooting for these guys. I hope. Everything, uh, I hope everything works out, and I hope that, uh, you know, some of these little, um, we'll call them speed bumps, iron themselves out, um, but I, I am I am skeptical, and maybe there's an answer to this, and, I, and I'm just not seeing it. I, I hope that there becomes a very clear and, and, and prominent answer of what what compelling, des what compelling desktop use there is for this operating system over the other alternatives, and uh, I hope that you're right. Yeah, you know, I look at this and I think it's it is uh, it to me it feels it feels like it brings the simplicity of Chrome OS with the power of the GNOME desktop. Mm -hmm. And if that sounds appealing to you, then I think you're the use case for this. If that doesn't sound appealing to you, then you're not. And do you think is that fair? Absolutely. And there are people, that, and it's important to remember there are people that that uh, that 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 is their use case. My 66 year old mother. That is her use case. She wants to sit down at her computer, she wants to open Firefox, and she wants to browse the internet. Right, exactly. And she does that in Firefox. You know, but I got to say, though, Noah, uh, 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 really, all other things considered, uh, RC1, for a distribution made oh, yeah. completely from scratch with their yes. own desktop, uh, holy crap, this is a very impressive yes. release. We'll have links in the show notes. You should go check it out. Go look at the Solo S project. They are really working on something unique. It's like no other distribution you've ever played with. And that is a Linux Action Show's look at SolOS. Or Solus. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Before we get out of here, we got to read some emails for folks who went over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact and emailed the show because they chose Linux Action Show from the dropdown. Our first one comes in from Brad K., he says, hey, Chris, and no, I recently wrote a novel, and once it dropped on Amazon, it dawned on me that this might be the revel this might be relevant to your show. I'm a longtime fan of the Linux Action Show and anything Linux, and I was driving. Uh, I says, I do my, some of my best thinking while stuck in traffic. Me too, man. Good, word up, Brad. I realized I had written my entire novel using Linux software. The book itself was written in LibreOffice Writer, much to the consternation of my publisher, Brainstorming was done in FreeMind or in XMind, both good mind mapping programs, 
and rearranging of scenes and chapters was done in the Linux version of Scrivener. Uh, Scrivener is an exceptionally good uh, program for anyone that is writing longish document. By the way, if you're using nan if you're doing Nanoramo, uh, or Nano Nano Nanoramo, yeah, Nanoramo, Scrivener is a great application for that for this month, uh, and it works under Linux. You just got to go get the beta. My editor and I tried to use Google Docs, but 300 pages is just a pain and become became totally unusable. Uh, my writer was a workhorse that never once let me down. Oh, a Libre writer was a workhouse workhorse. Anyway. I don't know if anyone else has written in with similar experiences or not, so I thought I'm, you might be interested. If anyone wants to grab the book, they can download it for free from Amazon through Friday, today, the 20th. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Friday the 20th. It's called Coins, C-O-I-N-S, The Five Hammers of Void. It's light fantasy stuff. Thanks for fighting the good Linux fight, and thanks for the great shows. You know, no, I got to say, uh, Hadia, my girlfriend, is doing Scrivener, uh, is using Scrivener, mm -hmm. Under uh, Ubuntu Mate 1510, she's been doing NaNoWriMo, and she's writing like a machine. And if you go to Scrivener's website, you dig around, they have a beta available for Linux. You can just run the binary, and it works. And I don't even think you have to license it because it's beta. So you can just hmm. use Scrivener for free under Linux. So there's there one thing in the in the in the hastily fact, uh, and I was picking out feedback this week. Um, the thing that stood out to me was, uh, do you ever wonder how books are done? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, like, like seriously, I mean, like maybe, like maybe, feels, maybe everyone, yeah. maybe what everyone else like knows, but I've thought about that before. I've been like, I wonder if they just, if everyone like just has a really long Microsoft Word document, yeah, or is yeah. there like some like, yep. un, is there yeah. like some oh, like, yeah, industry man. standard oh, yeah, man. that just everyone uses? No, so it's this Word. Guy did it in LibreOffice. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. All right, so Sam, uh, Sam writes in, and he has a er, he has uh, he has something to tell us about OpenSUSE Leap Spin Gecko Linux important updates. Last week, I wrote to you about my little project to make OpenSUSE more usable and approachable for those who aren't familiar with the SUSE way of doing things. I'm calling it Gecko Linux. And he gives us a link. In its current available, it's an installable live DVD image with the Cinnamon desktop. Since its initial release, I found a number of important mis uh, important missing features and needed refinements, which I believe I have now corrected. Ooh. I have implemented working CUPS printer support and configuration utilities. Disk encryption is now supported at installation. And the cool SUSE snapper utility for automatically creating nice. grub bootable snap system snapshots. I also relaxed the Paul Paul kit security policy to allow for common tasks like mounting and unmounting disks and connecting and disconnecting Wi-Fi without entering the root password. You gotta love that. Wi-Fi installations should be now possible. Possible. All in all, it's turning out to be a pretty nice spin. All thanks to SUSE Studio and the fantastic open source infrastructure. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comment on. Yeah. Gecko Linux when you have time. You know, I, I don't have thoughts on Gecko Linux, but I do have thoughts on SUSE Studio, and I don't understand why this hasn't made SUSE one of the biggest deals. It is mm -hmm. really pretty cool. And I, the only thing I can figure is, is that what it shows us is it doesn't matter how fancy your tools are, if you don't have enough people using the distro, if there's not a uh, fundamental compelling reason to use the distro, it doesn't matter about the ancillary tools. But it is very, very nice, and I hope long term it makes more and more people check out OpenSUSE. What do you think, Noah? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I have to play with it a little bit more. I haven't had uh, a lot of time to dig into some of that, but uh, I yeah. definitely like to look into it. Yeah, uh, I, Here, I oh, go ahead. Well, no, just I was gonna jump uh, jump topics for a second. I went to Amazon. I can't seem to download this for for free. So if anyone in the chat room has an idea of how I can download this this coins book, I'd be interested in, yeah. in kind of checking it. And uh, he's calling it. By the way, if you want to check it out, he's calling it Gecko Linux, like he mentioned, Gecko Linux .io, If you guys would like to check it out, I mean, why not? We go check out another last viewer's uh, spin. That's pretty cool. I think that's pretty neat. You know, uh, you can go find all of links, all of the goodness, all of the relevance over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. But things that we specifically talked about for this episode, jupiterbroadcasting.com. Go look for episode 392 of The Big Show, and you'll find links pretty much in chrono chronological order. Not always, because we like to just throw you for a loop and see if you're really paying attention. So sometimes we don't do that. But you can find links to everything we talked about over there. You can also find Noah at Colonel Linux on the Twitters or go find his day job, altaspeed.com. Noah, is there anything else you'd like to point people to? No, I think you pretty much covered it. All right, well, your face. And uh, I don't know what our plan is uh, for uh, episode 393 because it's going to normally air during Black Friday and uh, like the whole Thanksgiving holiday season. We may have a live show on Sunday. We may do like a best of cut together of our favorite open source projects. Whatever, whatever happens, 393 is going to be something that we're pretty proud of. 
we're, we're kind of considering something that's sort of like a thankful for open source episode. We don't quite have it nailed down yet, but tune in next week if you want to join us live, and we really would like you to have you join us live, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. The robots over there are waiting on demand. I pay them in Bitcoin, so please, regardless if you visit the website, I'm paying them in Bitcoin. These robots... The only thing that prevents them from taking over the world is you visiting jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and me compensating them with bitcoins that I generate from my GPU. It is a tenuous, barely preventing the robot apocalypse situation, and you can avoid it by going to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and by visiting us over at jblive.tv. We also have so much more at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Links, news stories, projects we should spotlight, feedback we should address, all those kinds of things, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Go join almost 10,000 of you who have the best Linux website on the net. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here next week. After I dropped you off at the airport, you were staring at the wall and getting onto a plane, and I drive like a maniac back to System76, and... Then, as you're probably aware, you can imagine in your head, I had to find parking, which took a long time. Oh, man. And then I had to lose my, yeah. And then I had to lose myself on the way back to System 76. I got lost four or five times. Oh, man. And I wasn't there to help. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was really bad. And then I fa- finally found it. And by that time, uh, everyone was already watching a movie. <laughs> what movie? Do you remember the movie? Star Trek. Or Star Wars. <laughs> oh, no. I made a mistake. Uh, dude. Don't kill me. You're going to pay for know, that later. Also, Continue I know, on. I know, I know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'm just going to save that away and put it down in my tummy. Okay. All right. I knew I was going to get in trouble the second I left my mouth. Well, so they're watching Star Wars, and I didn't want to be rude and interrupt the movie, so I just packed everything up in the dark. Pure, pitch black, dark. Oh my god, dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was fun. So after I pack everything up, I uh, Rikai is, telegrams me and says, Noah, where are the video clips? And so I look at where that computer was, and it's gone. And there is just an empty monitor cord. The servo? The oh no, the dude's computer is his personal yeah, machine. Yeah, dude's computer is gone. So I go to find the dude, and I'm like, hey, where's the dude with the tats Anthony. up and down his arm? Yeah. And they're like, oh, he left for the night. And I'm like, uh, did he take his computer with him? And they're like, well, uh, looks like it. And I'm like, that's not good. So then I'm thinking, if I worked for an IT com- or a computer company, I would image my computer before I took it home. Because I have all the imaging stuff there. Why would I bother walking through the install when System76 is? So I'm like, he imaged it, and all of our recordings are gone. And I'm like, well... Good thing reco- recorded back at the studio because they're just gone. So I call. So finally, I get the dude on the phone. He's like, "No, they're in my computer, but the, I took the cooler off, so you can't boot it up." And I'm like, uh, "No problem. We'll just rip the hard drive out." So we rip the hard drive out and we start putting it into like every computer in System 76, trying to get the d- darn thing to boot. And we can't get it to boot. So it's like, "All right, well, we do a fresh install on a different hard drive. Plug that hard drive in, and now we have access to the files." I'm like, "All right." So I start dumping them to the FTP because I can't use Dropbox. Well, I, I guess I could have reinstalled Dropbox, but I, I didn't have Dropbox. Dropbox wasn't running. So I start copying to the FTP. Guess what? FTP fills up. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. So I'm like, all right. So then I start copying them over to my thumb drive, copy them all over to my thumb drive. And I'm like, all right, I drive back to the hotel. Now, mind you, I have to be at the air. I have a 9 a.m. flight or whatever, which means I have to be up at five. And I'm sorting through the ending of that whole tax issue. Um, with my accountant and my wife who had been working on some stuff earlier in the day and I get done at like two in the morning and I'm like, oh, and then Rakai's like, hey, any chance I can get those files? I'm like, yes, I'm doing them right now. So I plug them into my laptop and I start the sync into Dropbox and I just pass out in the bed. Wake up the next morning to realize I didn't plug the power adapter into my laptop. So now I have two problems. One is I'm not sure if the file is actually completed or not. Two is the, my laptop is now dead. And three is uh, I have to get to the airport. So I get to the airport, I land, and I, it, Rakai goes, yeah, the files didn't copy. I'm like, all right, I'll do it as soon as I get home. I land and I forget I have that walkthrough. So within an hour. Like so right can, as you land, you have that yeah, walkthrough, yeah, basically. Right. And you have an hour drive to make it home even. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, I have. I, so anyway, so by the time I get on the road, I have 45 minutes to make an hour drive. And so it uh, turns out if you increase your speed just a little bit, you can make that happen. <laughs> and so uh, I get to the walkthrough and I'm, I'm halfway through the walkthrough and Rakai's like, Man, I'm I'm really waiting on those files, and I don't mean to rush you, but like I can't really get anything. Oh done. my gosh! Thank you, Rikai, and, for continuing to push Noah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. I'm going home to do it right now. So I drive home, and I, I and I'm I start the files uploading, and I'm like, Rikai, 
Spam the heck out of my phone. I haven't slept and I because I, I, I didn't get much sleep the whole trip actually really and I'm really tired So I'm gonna go lay yeah, down. No kidding. Neither one of us did so I wake up and I guess what I'm For whatever reason I must have been really tired because I didn't hear my phone go off one of the hundred and thirty seven times that Rakai telegrammed me but the, Like the main file that he needed didn't get uploaded Dude, Rukai so now, is your bro because he I totally know. did not out know, you at I all know, for know, any know, of I this. Know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, so then, so, so then I get, uh, so then I get up and I'm like, oh no. So I'm like, I'm scrambling to find the files. The that world's he needs. largest podcast, Linux podcast, oh. on the precipice of complete obliteration. Yes, yes, and all, and here's the, here's, the, and so anyway, it eventually comes down to the clip that I need. I don't think is on my thumb drive. I'm like, I don't have it. It's on Chris's GoPro, so we'll have to get it from him. And he's like, yeah, that's not good. And I'm like. Well, hold on. Let me check. And so, I, oh, I it was on my laptop because I copied the SD card that, that that night to edit some right. video. So I'm like, maybe it's still on my laptop. So I look, and sure enough, it's there, and it uploaded, and then nobody knew the wiser. But like, it came down to the wire, and he had to work really hard to make that happen. And it was all my fault. And he came through, and it was amazing. I think you owe that guy five guys. I I think I owe him more than just a little five guys. Yeah. You're gonna have to come out in January just to get all the five guys that you have paid off. <laughs>